Hi, and welcome to this webinar where we will be talking about digital fraud and COVID-19. Thank you for joining. Um, before we start some practical information, this is recorded, so it's possible to view it later. If you have any questions as we go along, the, there should be a question function depending on what uh, app or browser you're using, you should see a question function. So please use that one to ask questions. And we'd really like to know your opinion on some questions. So if you look at the bottom left of the screen, there's a QR code. If you scan that with your, your cell phone, you're going to see some questions. And if you could go through and just answer them, we're going to have a look at the results as we go along. So I want to welcome my two guests there, Jacoba and Simon. Jacoba, all-round expert, been doing IAM for a number of years and uh, working with major banks and member of experts group working with SSI and working in ISO and IDNX. So Welcome, Jacoba. Good to see you again. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to be with you. Yeah, I guess it's half a year since we last uh, were on a panel together, so it's uh, good to have you on here again. Yep, done any traveling since uh, last time we talked? No, not, no, only, yeah, well, I've been to France to buy a house and then came back and can't go back again. But never oh, mind. Wow. No, I've been working from home, like most of us, I suppose. All right. I guess that's true for you as well, Simon. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, Simon works for Onfido, expert in identity documents, security and fraud, and uh, it's a key role in the product strategy of Onfido. And uh, it's very good to have both of you on here. And we're going to discuss fraud today, right? Yes, looking forward to it. Right. And uh, if uh, somebody just joined, uh, as I mentioned, there's a QR code down uh, to the left of your screen where you um, where we want to ask you some questions. And we're going to have a look at those as we go along. So the first things, uh, I mean, we want to talk about how things have changed, what, what is different, what has happened. And um, this is not going to be a big slideshow, but uh, we did a research called the Battle on Board where we ask consumers uh, specifically on their uh, experiences with financial services. And it turned out 41% have had challenges uh, getting to financial services. It's a big number. What do you think, Simon? Why, why is this? Um, I, I think sort of probably what we're looking at here, it could be the fact we've got a lot of um, inexperienced users who are now being forced by the COVID situation to to go online, you know, you've got a lot of people um, who are maybe a bit more technophobic or just not as on, not as up to date with or, or comfortable with uh, doing things remotely or by computer. Um, they would go down to a physical branch and now they can't do that anymore, um, and that's going to be quite a large percentage. So it doesn't surprise me that you've got a lot of people that would struggle with this. And then when you factor into that as well, the fact um, that many of these organisations are kind of fledgling in the remote environment as well. So again, their previous processes have all been physical, they've all been in person, uh, and now they're having to come up but maybe improvise or fast forward on some of the ideas to bring people on board remotely, and there's gonna be some growing pains with that. So, you know, you've, you've got both both sides of the equation. You've got a, a lot of new variables in there, so that, would, that, would, that doesn't surprise me, that figure, I've gotta be honest. Um, right. uh, yeah, the fact it's less than fifty percent is um, is quite a bonus, as far as I see it. Right. Uh, so, I mean, you mentioned a lot of inexperienced users. What does this have to do with fraud, Jacoba? What do you think? Um, well, in a, even if they don't, um, if they are not inexperienced, still it could be very complex. Even experienced people could. Uh, make mistakes and, and, and are not aware. Uh, for instance, um, I helped my mother for uh, doing their on, her online banking, but she even doesn't know the concept of a password and a user ID. It's even to that level of her experienceness. And, and then if you log in with the user ID, which is your email address, which also have its, has its own password, you have to draw a lot of pictures just it's, it is complex, even for experienced users, let alone for unexperienced users. So um, one, on one end, they may um, make mistakes and fraud may increase, 
but the same lady was very proud when she found out, oh, I may have a phishing uh, mail and I, I detected it and I didn't, I, they didn't get me. She was very proud. On the wow. other hand, I'm never going to install any banking on my laptop uh, or on my phone because that's very insecure and there are a lot of fraudsters. So people may not access it at all in a, uh, as an inexperienced user uh, hmm. by fear. That could be the other impact. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I well, think at the same time, well, I was going to say, even with, your, uh, even with experienced users, you still have people that they, they might be quite comfortable and au fait with jumping online or using the technology, but that doesn't mean that they're immune or particularly aware of the scams that are available. Even some of the, the oldest scams that, you know, people in the know might be completely comfortable with. Yeah, OK, well, I, I won't get fooled by the, what's the, I remember when I was much younger, there was the, the your, your porn star name which was the name of your first pet and your mother's maiden name. And everyone would go, oh yeah, and they'd rush to put that one. And it's like, well, that, that's great. That's two of your security questions that you've just shot. And, and people were just quite comfortably doing it, posting it online. I think there was one that's like, what's your Star Wars Android's name? So it would be your postcode and then the last three digits or something else. Yeah, it, 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 was, it, was, it was very easy for fraudsters. And you would think with us being so much more connected that people would be more aware of these and these scams wouldn't be as prevalent. But even amongst people that are regular online users, very comfortable with technology, glued to their phones, some of these scams are still very, very effective. All right. So when, when was the last time you uh, clicked on a scam uh, link, Simon? I don't think I have because I'm just far too suspicious of everybody. <laughs> if I get I anything did. unsolicited, I, 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 I won't touch it. Yeah. Yeah. I did click no, on a no. scam, which was a phishing, um, uh, which was in the bank where I worked but it was uh, from the security department to test all the employees. And they made it look like it's a mail from the HR department. And it was really not possible to find out that it wasn't. So uh, they were fishing their own employees to test them. And that yeah. one, yes. I right. think 80% of us uh, went wrong there. Went for it, yeah. And, and yeah. Then, as, as I no said, Simon's campaign. Someone... Yeah, so, some of them are so good as well. I mean, I fell for one that uh, looked like it came from from the mail server and said, you know, there's a suspic suspicious attachment and click here, you know, to look at it. And of course, you had to log in. And after I provide my credentials, mm. that's where my brain kicked in and, oh, no, okay, and then yeah. go change the password. So, I mean, even we can do <laughs> it because some of them are, are really good. Hmm. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's it, it's the same techniques that we're seeing online. They've always been done physically as well. Um, you know, it's I, I always I, I don't get a lot of uh, online phishing emails, but I do get a lot of phone calls. Oh, I get okay. loads of phone calls where they're they're asking me sort of like, hey, have you been in an accident? Just give us your bank details and we'll sort that out. It's, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> you know I mean? oh, we've noticed there's going to be a virus in your account. Great. Do you know my IP address? Why are you being difficult? Sorry. <laughs> I know. It's, so uh, it's quite common. Yes, I mean it's it's a lot of social engineering, right? And and I guess also that's why we see the impersonation scams have have doubled. And I mean this is relating to a lot of inexperienced users and employees as well being uh, I mean being forced to work remotely. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean you know this is one of the things that we've um, we've looked at on Fido as well. Um, you've got this problem where you have data that's leaked. So you've got data that's hacked where sort of someone can quite easily just go and, ha well, not quite easy, but with relative ease, can obtain your picture from somewhere. Uh, and we, we've seen data hacked where someone's identity document and a nice selfie like a profile pic has been hacked as well. And then both of those credentials have been used to open a false account. So if you're doing facial yeah. similarities, then you've got, um, you know, you've got the right face for the document um, because all of that material has been sourced from the same place. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, if you're not putting in the necessary checks in your remote uh, onboarding, then this, this is definitely a, a, a viable problem. Yeah, I think especially in banking where you have not just the identification, but also the background checks. Um, I did an online um, onboarding, becoming a customer of a bank, totally online because it was a French bank and I needed that because I was moving to French, France. And um, actually, I was looking for one which could do that and had a branch in France. 
it would uh, do, uh, it appeared to be a, a British bank where I could onboard in France, which a French branch branch of a British bank. And uh, it was very complex. I had, as you know, uh, you had to identify yourself by sending in your electricity bill and other proof of address, which we don't do in the Netherlands. We have our uh, identity from the government and that would cover everything. But uh, in the end, I managed to get totally digital identity and a bank account online with them. And the last step would be to add money to that bank account and but it took uh, almost six weeks, but it worked. And um, now I'm using that bank account, but even logging on to their app is so complex. It's, there, it's yeah, so there's the, um, the enemy of security is usability. Um, and I guess um, you can use biometrics, but for onboarding to, to start knowing somebody, you need a lot of information. And I think that's, that's um, the start of the chain is the most difficult part, uh, the challenge of onboarding, but tying this digital identity to a natural person. And if it goes wrong there, you could chain up with uh, yeah, uh, using that identity for other, for other things. But I think most yeah, banks are now pretty well equipped to do that. And that has um, also geared up. Now we have this uh, COVID, uh, so there it made a good difference that more banks are more online uh, for the total process, including the signing and whole stuff. And I think signing in itself could be discussed maybe later on because without uh, putting your signature there, you can't go to the notary. And if you don't do the signing online, you still have to work with a lot of paper and printing and scanning and so on. There could still be um, a fraud attack factor. So next to the identity, what you do with it. That, that would be another area. Yeah, no, I, I tend to agree. It's, um, you know, we've, it, it's still quite a painful transition. We've, we've made lots of big steps um, and COVID, as I say, has kind of accelerated this. You know, as, as you find throughout history, every time there is some major incident, it accelerates uh, technology yeah. in certain ways. So, you yeah. know, when you look at the wars and how they sort of like move science forward, now we've got COVID, it's forcing everyone to lock down. So we're seeing a lot more inroads being made in uh, remote technology and remote access, and working from home and how you can do things remotely instead of physical. Um, but, you know, along with that, it, it, it's still kind of a painful transition for, for some of those aspects. So like you mentioned, signing documents. I, I know you've got certain apps and certain products that will allow you to do that remotely, um, but it's how reliable that is compared to the original. What have we lost? Um, you know, having worked with uh, handwriting experts as well, I know that there's that before any of this happened, there were lots of studies into how we could digitize the actual handwriting process, like the pressure of it and everything else like that, because that's quite an important part, the indentation and the amount of stress or pressure you put on certain points in a signature. Um, quite how you do that when no one's going to have any, you know, you, you can't, um, confirm that everyone's going to have the right physical equipment you're not turning up somewhere where they're going no. to have the physical equipment. so it's how can we do that um you know it's can you do that from a, a touch pad on a laptop is that possible are they anywhere near sensitive enough i, I don't think they are um mm -hmm. but it's these kind of problems that are going to sort of um, we, we're going to have to find solutions for those as we move forward Right. I, I did see one interesting solution and I don't know what happened it, but the point there was using the, the gravity sensors in your phones. You were actually, you know, doing your signature in the air like this and then measuring mm -hmm. the gravity sensors and that. And that would be really oh. hard for, for somebody to replicate. So that's, you know, interesting aspect yeah. of that. So, but I mean, yeah. Jacoba, you must be really that reminds patient. I mean, me six the, weeks the... to get a bank account, right? Yeah. Uh, especially when you need it for your uh, to establish your electricity connection in your new home. But yeah. um, I must say this bank was really supportive. Uh, they were easily to be reached. They made phone calls wherever possible. I had an assistant that would be the real person uh, assistant. And um, I knew it was, I'm, I am, I've been working on these processes in three banks, so I know about it, but so I knew it could be a difficult one. And I knew I had to find a bank who could do it and validate that before I started the whole process. But mm. I'm a tech savvy person and I'm in the, in the business. Huh? And even yeah. for me, although I could know what I would expect, it was 
a tedious process and I've checked some people who had were in the same boat as me going to France buying a house and you have these interest groups and um, most of them didn't manage even though they went to the same uh, bank and uh, well I think that uh, at least 25 to 30 percent of customers they skip or they leave the onboarding process in banking yeah. because it's too complex to do the whole identification process online. This, this comes back to the first slide we had about the 41% yeah. drop off. It's it's not, that's what yeah. I mean, it's not altogether a surprise. The surprise to me was that it was as low as 41. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've got all these hoops yeah. to jump through before everything was forced online. The fact it's now all become remote, you know, I, I'm not surprised by that number. No, and and uh, going. I mean, as we said, I mean the, the the first step is establishing. I mean, there are two fraud attack vectors, right? One is is establishing the identity, and the other one is uh, takeover. But for the establishment, we need all this document. And I've always been used by you know this the the authoritative document of your identity, the electricity bill, right? That's sort of interesting how that yeah. plays. <laughs> in the Anglo-Saxon countries, it, the, the address, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, you wanted to add some comments around this, uh, uh, Simon. I mean, this is the document fraud trends. Yeah, certainly. So um, uh, once a year uh, on Fido, we put together a fraud report. We've been doing it for the last couple of years and we analyze our traffic for um, all of our different clients uh, and we look for any general trends or patterns that we can see. Uh, and certainly from 2019 to, to 2020, we saw a, a general upscale in the amount of fraud. Um, you can see that with the graph on the left here. So um, in the kind of, I guess you would call it salmon color, um, you have the total fraud rate over time. And as you can see, as we're going along in the months, it has actually picked up. It's uh, a general trend that we're seeing. Um, the biggest rise there from an individual region would have been um, the rest of Europe. United Kingdom is the blue line uh, and the yellow line, if you can see that on your monitors, is uh, the United States. So we saw that during that period, there was a general surge. You can see there's quite a large spike as we're coming into uh, 2020 um, when lockdown started around April. Suddenly there's a massive surge in fraud and it hasn't gone down. Um, but this is, you know, it, we, we've talked about this. We're driving everything online. It's only logical that the fraud is going to follow. If you've had people that have been committing physical fraud, they are now forced, like everyone else has been, to take everything online. They have to work from home too. It's a real sad time for criminals out there. You know, you've got to work from home as well. Um, but the thing is, when, we, when we've looked at this as well, previously we found that fraud was a lot more of uh, nine to five, Monday to Friday. You know, they're, they're good, honest fraudsters, just like the rest of us. They like to earn their wedge. So Monday to Friday, yeah. nine to five, honey, I'm home. I've committed 300 acts of fraud today, but gosh, am I ready for my dinner? Um, and instead, we're looking at now a trend since lockdown started. There's nowhere to go. So 24-7 is now the norm. We're seeing right. that fraud hasn't yeah, dropped I, off. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Someone oh, from the University of Leuven did a research um, and he uh, analyzed the registration of phishing websites. When were they registered? And they answered exactly to this nine to five and weekends and even summer holidays, Easter holidays, Christmas holidays, when the registration of fraudulent web <laughs> websites, uh, URLs, domain names would be uh, completely going down. So that was a very interesting research. Even the, yeah, I, I guess he has to redo his research and uh, find the current <laughs> yeah. pattern, which would probably be in sync with that. I, I've, I've said this phrase a couple of times with regards to COVID, but it, it, Pandora's box is open and everything has now gone online. Everything has gone remote. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, realistically, we can't expect to pack it back up and become a more physical, uh, you know, expect physical interactions to take take back their precedence, um, you know, their, their prominence like they did before. Uh, everything is going to stay remote for the majority because it's cheaper and it's easier, mm -hmm. um, more or less. Uh, and it's the way the industry was always headed towards anyway, and we just had a catalyst. Um, so I think these trends that we've seen with fraud with regards to it being sort of like a 24-7 event as opposed to, you know, Mondays to Fridays, 9 to 5, I, I think this is now the norm. As long as we've still got this environment where I've got access to it at any time, then that is going to be what we see from the fraudsters from now on. Exactly. So... 
Um, before we go into, you know, discuss, you know, we, we talked about some of the background. Uh, I said initially, uh, and if somebody joined later, there's a QR code. We like to answer some, uh, ask you some questions. So if you just go into that, but let's uh, look at uh, what people have answered to what we have. We asked, you know, what industry we're in, and uh, we have talked a lot about banking. Well, there's some in in uh, finance, uh, finance, financial, some some e-commerce, uh, technology, and digital identity, uh, of course. Uh, can we see the next uh, result, please? Just asking where people are from. So spread around different countries in in Europe. So that's uh, that's interesting. Um, and then the next question was uh, how much people agree to this fraud. And, and uh, it's interesting to see, you know, what do people uh, think about uh, the fraud space? I mean, fraud in general has increased. People agree to that. I guess we can all agree to that. Uh, Fewer people are saying uh, that there's an increase in fraud uh, for their business. And also interesting, my business volume has grown during COVID. I mean, you would think a lot of businesses would lose uh, on this one, but it's actually also uh, above average. Any comments to this, uh, Jacoba? Well, I guess if you're in uh, the digital business, if you're selling digital uh, solutions or IT equipment or uh, home working uh, chairs or desks or screens uh, you you may have seen and or, or working in the mailing uh, service it uh, depends what you're doing if you have a facilitator for people working at home you may have been the business volume may have grown and uh, yeah if you're in the retail business of uh, non as we call it non-crucial type of products we all know they have gone down and they're all shutting down if you see the city centers here in the Netherlands, only the supermarkets are opened and the rest is down since months mm -hmm. and months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not so surprising. I think the home delivery for food, if you look at, if you'd make a walk in the city center here in Utrecht in the Netherlands, you see piles of boxes, ball.com, food delivery, uh, you know, the, the, the paper waste of boxes delivered, purchases on, uh, uh, online are, very much increased but um fraud i think that the banks they were already pretty much uh, governed on security when you're in a bank uh I w when i was the head of identity in one of the major banks in the netherlands every year i got three different auditings for the safety and security of my identity systems that's heavily regulated so i guess the fraud may have changed and in banks, they don't do the individual fraud with phishing as much as trying to get to the heart of the bank itself, hacking the SWIFT, Swift network where the uh, financial messages between banks are routed, uh, really different type of attacks. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, they may have stayed more or less the same, but... Uh, yeah, any medium to small business, they don't have the budgets to hire these expensive people like us <laughs> to, uh, to, to really, really thoroughly uh, start up big projects for safety and security. And then customer awareness or user awareness, that could also be a really, um, yeah, difficult thing because it's complex matter. So yeah, maybe this moves right. already to the next uh, level, next question. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, looking at that, it strikes me that anyone who's going to be attending this is probably set up to to work remotely nowadays. They're they're, they're kind of prepped or they're they're thriving because they are able to make that transition. We're less likely to see in this particular webinar attendees from a high street retailer who's suffering. So it's the, the, the no. figures are more <laughs> indicative of our demographic, I think, really. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, and no, I mean, you mentioned uh, all the cardboard boxes. I mean, that's where we should have invested a year ago, right? In the cardboard <laughs> industry, because yeah. I, I have a mountain yeah, of cardboard yeah, boxes yeah, in my yeah, backyard. Exactly. Well, well, we had a yeah an interesting case yesterday here on the street. There were a pile of boxes, and on each of them, the label of the uh, receiver name, surname, uh, home address, <laughs> phone number were on the labels. And someone oh. put them on Facebook to complain in the city app uh, about what a mess, all these boxes, let's do naming and shaming. And they were photographing all these labels wow. of all each of the polluters. And then there was a, an interesting discussion on privacy, whether that's already public data, 
because it was on the street or is it yeah. something you should do now yeah well, that's, I mean, this, this, uh, this brings it home to the end user though doesn't it it's uh you know people yeah. are just throwing it away going well whatever it's not that yeah. you're actually you know it's it's like if you're putting out your bills and you're not shredding them you're you're leaving a weakness yeah, you're leaving exactly a with, with, with whole uh, scan codes and and delivery and phone numbers and and and, and even in some cases of what was in there so yeah, if I were a social engineering expert, I would go harvesting every day. Right. So well, I, I wanted new, to. New I business a, opportunity for fraudsters, huh? Yeah. Well, I, I, had, a storage, yeah. I had a storage unit, um, uh, a unit in a, a storage warehouse, and the storage warehouse got broken into. They informed me that mine was one of the units that had been broken into, and it was fraudsters that were they weren't trying to nick valuables. They were going from one unit to the next, trying to see if they could find any information, any identity documents, any addresses, any of these kind of things uh, uh, uh. that they could use for identity theft. They weren't interested in yeah. the expensive items that you got in there. I think you noticed the electric drum kit. I had symbols at that point. And I had a nice drum kit. They weren't interested in any of that, any of the computer items. They were going straight in there, wow. getting bits of paper. That was all they were right. stealing. Yeah. But OK, let, let's get back to oh, you. Know, here comes what, what we... It's easy. Yeah. So back to what are, what are we trying to to do to fight this? I mean, going back to the onboarding, saying you know you can can do, you know onboard as somebody else if you get that identity data. So if you know I broke into your storage unit and I found all the data about you, and I would use that to try to impersonate you, Simon. How how would I mean? What what are we doing to fight that sort of threat scenario? Yeah, I mean this is where companies like like Onfido comes in, this is uh, what we're there to do. So part of the process is, you know, we're, we're asking people when they're on board to present a, an identity document because there are physical aspects about that document that even in an online environment, we can still uh, check and authenticate to a certain extent. Um, and we're always looking to improve upon those as well. Um, and in addition to that, we marry that up with biometrics. So we're looking to capture people's face and then run facial similarities. We, we take it a step further. The selfie itself is compromised or potentially compromised. It's, it's not sufficient if you're trying to raise the bar of your security. So the next level is you look at liveness, which is what we do, where um, you have a, a video of someone and it will have a challenge in there as well, a random challenge so that you can't just have a stock uploaded video. If you're able to um, liveness break checks. into that video, yeah. Yeah, if you're able yeah. to break into that corridor between the provider and the end user, uh, if you can break that VPN and you can upload whatever you want, putting in a, a random challenge, a random liveness challenge means that the, the fraudster is unable to just put up a stock loaded video, uh, which is quite helpful with the problem that we're seeing emerge now that people are getting wise to, which is deep fakes. You know, it's, it's harder to do those if they are live so far. This is always what I say with any fraud. It's so far at the moment we're ahead, as far as we know. And it's a constant battle, right? I mean, I saw the Tom Cruise deepfake yesterday, and uh, it was really actually fascinating. very good. And it would be really hard for anybody to detect that one. Yeah, no, no, that one. I, I, I think the thing is when you when you're looking at deepfakes, there's there is an element about it, but they're certainly getting a lot better. I mean, that one. Yeah, there's, there's, there's an element around the face that to me just immediately said deep fake, but I, I think it's, they're, they're getting so much harder. They're getting really, really good. So the only thing you can do is have these liveness challenges to try and prevent it um, at the moment. But then there are other things that we can do as well. There, there, there are other signals that relate to the device and the signature of the device. There are things that we can access that will confirm yeah. locations, that kind of thing. Uh, I, don't, I don't ever like to go into too much detail yeah. because, you know, again, going, when I used to go to court, I was always aware of every bit of information that I was uh, putting out to show someone how I detected something would then get used in the next iteration of the fraud. So I'm always a little bit wary about how much we're giving away in a live webinar. But. Yeah, another interesting technology which we tried in the bank is uh, behavior sec meaning that you have your uh, your iphone your device uh, you have your way of walking with that device in your hand and you have your way of using your finger the pressure the gauge oh, so the way you hold the phone up that's a very unique personal um profile and you can convert that through an algorithm to a number of figures or whatever 
and that can be improved anytime you use it, your identity by usage becomes stronger and stronger and more unique. Uh, of course, when you lose your phone, you would have to re-enter that whole scenario and re-behave, uh, let's say. So you are what you do, which is very difficult. Even if you would steal the data, you could never, ever, ever act exactly like I do. And um, uh, yeah, well, of course, there's always a problem with false positives, people who get in wrongly and false negatives. But uh, I think that's a very interesting type of biometrics um, next to the, uh, the ones we know with fingerprinting and facial, uh, but only once you're onboarded. It's, it's um, more for authentication, yeah, making um, your identity stronger. Yeah. It's not a thing that from the start exists, but it's, uh, I think it's a very nice way of uh, making sure that um, no one can do what you can do with your iPhone or with That's your right. and I, whatever I think smartphone. I think it's important that, you know, combination of different biometrics. I mean, one by yeah. itself is not necessarily enough, but you combine mm -hmm. different methods. And, you know, like the way I like to put it is that my, my phone, which is a really powerful computer, knows that it's in my possession. So if, Jacoba, if you stole my phone and yeah. you ran down yeah. the street, the first thing my phone would say, running, John doesn't run, so this must be somebody else, right? <laughs> and of course, it's yeah, going to exactly. disconnect yeah, from, yeah, yeah. Uh, it would from start my, the my uh, alarm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so no but i i think that that's a good and we did some experiments on that and but I, but i guess we're still not there yet i mean the technology and the battery capacity is is lacking still for uh, for that to to work yeah yeah and again that's that's requiring yeah. people another to thing is that uh that so i continue that continue. there is a web of trust when you have uh for instance you reset your your uh, password for your mail and you get a code through your out of band communication through your phone uh, when you have uh, various types of identities that play together into one more stronger identity which is also very modern these days when we talk about self-sovereign identity you carry your identity as a wallet with you with all the claims about you and all the uh, different ways that prove that you are you and validations extra to this is that you are owning it but i think it's a very good way of combining multiple identities into one strong identity that could always be repaired because it's not just that someone steals it and it's um compromised but also uh that you could lose it the availability it's not just about security um of being confidential but also the availability yeah, you need to access it and we all know these cases where we really needed our identity because we wanted to access something, but something went wrong and now we're at a loss. So um, re-enrollments, uh, re-establishing your identity is also, I think, one of the things that, that should always be, um, on the one hand, very difficult for strangers to do, but for the user, it should be really easy. And I think that's one of the compromises we have to make between security and uh, usability. But I think with yeah. these uh, set, uh, uh, big set of different ways of allies, allies to to walk, to establish or re-establish your identity or to authenticate, we, that could be the best solution. Yeah, no, I tend to agree. Yeah, so I mean, we have both sort of we, we want we need to strengthen the onboarding and still hopefully not take six weeks. We need to make simple onboarding. We're having yeah. good document scans, as, yeah. as Simon mentioned, and also some liveness detection. But then the other attack vector is if I can take over yeah. your EID, I'm going to impersonate you, right? And you know how to do that. And again, I'm still looking forward to the cell phone knowing it's my possession. And until then, we're still stuck with passwords and and uh, some second factor and uh, um we we asked yeah. uh, people are if they had to reevaluate their uh, approach to fraud let's see where people are and uh, yeah well that's a that's quite a decisive one <laughs> nobody answers no to this question so <laughs> yeah it's like again it's hardly a surprise is it i mean it's Moving into this new realm, for, well, for, for some people it's a new realm. It, it yeah. is, you do, you have to reevaluate this. We're, we're all vividly aware of going online means that there's going to be some level of fraud and you're opening your doors and now you're vulnerable in a way that you haven't been before. So, you know, it, 
it, it's it's common sense that you have to build in protections. I mean, you know, if you if you're a retailer, you had a little UV lamp that sat by the cash till, you know, um, you had a card machine, and, and now you had to come up with different ideas for the fact that you're selling something remotely and it's you know being dispatched. Mm, yeah. So and uh, yeah, as you said, we need with more and more customers. I mean, you're forced online and employees as well, of course. So uh, so it's it, it's good to see that the yes number is is uh, so high on this. Mm. It's reassuring. Yeah, it is really so uh, clever audience we have. Yeah, is that also <laughs> uh, partly due to the detection of uh, fraud? Because I think fighting fraud uh, starts with detecting fraud. When you do more online, you're also be more aware of the fraud that's happening, maybe. Mm. So yeah. it could be by the volume of the fraud, the volume of the business with the same level of fraud or the volume of the detection of the fraud. And I think with um, maybe Simon, that, that's your area, with uh, artificial intelligence or data analytics, uh, these days we, at least in banks, we detect a lot more fraud than we used to do before, because yeah. um, any pattern recognition, uh, we, you know, the, uh, one famous uh, recognition pattern we did, we found that, for instance, hackers, they all, all use very nice, very big screens with a very high resolution. So mm -hmm. that could be added as a parameter for potential fraud together with a set of other uh, uh, parameters. It would um, really be very helpful uh, if you see someone with that type of screen, uh, <laughs> that, that uh, the chance it would be a hacker combined with other uh, parameters could be really, uh, uh, yeah. Now, I think these technologies are oh, also okay. catching a lot of more, more fraud than we used to do years ago. Uh, we would only find the fraud after the fact, but now we could um, real-time monitor the patterns of yeah, the activity this is, happening. This is it. It's by, by finding the fraud retrospectively in the past, you know, you learn from your yeah. mistakes, as it were, and then you, you get better yeah, and yeah, you yeah. reiterate. Now, now we can mm -hmm. do it real-time. Um, the, the balancing act I think that any uh, anyone in IDV finds is that it's finding that that balance between um, getting as much information as you need to prevent fraud, but at the same time respecting people's privacy. There's certain areas that you know you're not going to be able to go into. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're they're yeah. Yeah. It's, I always it's, say it's, that there's a triangle between privacy, usability, and security. Uh, you want all three of them, but they are opposing all three of them, each other, privacy against security, security against usability, and so yeah. on. So that's yeah, the, that the three graces that you need to save as well as you can. And depending on the risk, you would choose the other, one of the other. And when, when there's a very high risk, you accept that usability is becoming smaller, like your front door. If you really have your when you want to keep it closed, you'll not uh, you really uh, take this difficult key. And if you're really afraid about confidentiality, you'd do more security. So there, I think there that that's always a balancing act in in, in fraud management, also in cybersecurity as a whole. Uh, but it, there's also a psychological element to that as well. If you don't have you know. If we, I mean, you know, we, we, we can do certain transactions and certain checks, we can do them in fractions of a second, which means that to the end user, they might yeah. not even notice it's a blip. But yeah. there's a reassurance in the amount of friction. So in some software, you actually build in a delay with a little screen with, this, with the clock face on it. It's not needed, but it makes the end user feel like there's something happening and therefore they're reassured that there's yeah. a decent security check going on. Yeah, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah, that yeah. the perception, the perceived security is is, is important. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah no, I, I, we did. Um, um, that's an interesting uh, point you made because uh, in my experience, we had three big banks in the Netherlands. Two were really hacked, and we were not. And then they were down, and uh, it was a just a um, um, denial of service attack. Never mind. They had been in the news and they had repaired paired it. The third one was not and was not attacked. And if you ask the audience about what was the safest bank, not the one that was not hacked or uh, attacked, the other two because they were in the news and there was in the news how they repaired it. So they had the incident, oh, so but they were perceived the as more secure, spins. which is really yeah. not nice if you are in the third one and you did your job. And exactly. That's, that's how well, it works. I mean, but so, that, that's yeah. failing on the PR department, surely. 
because what they should have been doing was yeah. putting out the story that, hey, we didn't get hacked because our security was better, not because we weren't yeah. looked at. That was yeah. the spin that should have come well, out of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, but, but I mean, it's where, not we, a security, it's the PR department yeah. that failed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we had a gentleman's agreement not to compete on security, but uh, that's why it didn't happen. But yeah, no. it's uh, but interesting I mean, it's uh, psychology. Security is, is important. And, and also, I yeah. think, also, I guess, from, from a pure personal view, I mean, depending on the value, I mean, if you're going to take up a mortgage for a large amount, you would expect more friction. It shouldn't be too easy. I mean, it's, I think like we could get that part sometimes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, COVID-19, I mean, we're all stuck at home. We have to use face masks. I mean, I know the Netherlands and other countries are in lockdown in Norway, where I am. We're not that bad off, but it's a lot of limitations. So it's, you know, been a lot of bad stuff. And of course, a lot of people being really sick and dying. So that's, uh, it's really sad, that part. But any positive, I mean, has there been any, have you any learnings, any positive effects from this? I mean, as I say, I mean, it, it has been a very tragic time, but like I alluded to earlier, it's whenever humanity, you know, mankind is, is faced with these kind of challenges, we, we kind of, we, we produce something positive out of it in that everything takes a big step forward. Um, and, and presumably we would look at the fact that we can do much more stuff remotely as a big step forward. It's, it's one of the few positives I think we mm -hmm. can take from this whole scenario. Um, so it's been a catalyst. It's forced everyone to look at certain things and assess whether we need to always be there. Can we do this remotely? And it's been a bit Darwinist, if you like, insofar as if you've been able to make that adaption, then you've thrived. Um, mm -hmm. If you haven't, then you've really suffered. But that's where government should, you know, in my opinion, anyway, that's, that's where the government should come in and support those businesses, because we really want those to come back to us when we're able to go back out. Um, mm -hmm. But I'd say that that's that's the positive is the fact that it has meant some leaps uh, forward in in this whole remote environment that we're working in. For me, yes, again, I agree. With that is a, a and I a think big, uh, also that. Uh, Sorry, you're okay, Um, the security. Yeah, well, I I fully agree with your statement. Uh, it has sped up a lot of things. Uh, maybe first in a quick and dirty way, and then later on in a more. Uh, study way that has uh, given uh, management a lot more security awareness but mm. also the users because yep. we yeah uh, the options and impossibilities are more clear to more users and um, i think that's a very good thing so it has become a lot more cool than it used to be and uh, maybe it also brings it better into the back into the uh, boardroom eh? because I, I in my opinion the problem with IT is always that it's for the techies and it's too difficult for the boardroom and it get, doesn't get a budget. And why doesn't IT solve this security issue? That's mm. the generic opinion. But this may have flipped. Now we see that it becomes a crucial business asset to be very secure with your digital uh, way of working for mm. a persistent security, not just uh, plastering the gaps and then leave it. But a sturdy, basic, good level of security needs boardroom um, awareness and budget. And um, I guess that may, well, what I, what I know from my environment is that uh, this, this is, that's the real switch we need to make, not just technology being able to do it and security tooling to be able to do it, but the governance and the people who decide to make this uh, flip and um, start pushing it and uh, yeah. being aware. No, I, I agree. I, I, I think that's it. I think you've, you've hit upon probably, and, and I'd overlook this, it's not just the fact that the technology has moved forward and that we've made these massive uh, sort of inroads, but it's it's also the fact, as you've just said, it's, it's the awareness and that in itself, I mean, if you're trying to combat fraud, the awareness is one of the most important features. Everyone needs to be mm -hmm. more aware of the fact that there are these dangers, that they need to take the necessary precautions. And yes, I think that's it. The fact that we've all had to make this shift yeah. has made that much more aware. And it, it doesn't just apply to identity theft or, or uh, online onboarding, but we, we can talk about everything like sort of like social media presence, um, you know, anything that you're doing that's uh, in an online environment. So I, th I think just that is probably, given the way that 
you know, the, the world was heading with so much stuff going online, the fact we've all had to stop, stay in, and then look at all these things, look at the effects that these things are having on us as a populace as well, the, the mental health impacts as well. I, I think that is, again, just raising the awareness all across yeah. the board is very important. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, it is. And I mean, the weakest link are still people. I mean, people are still sharing passwords. And I, I'm trying to say, well, if yeah. I share my credentials with you, I mean, hey, you go to the bank and pay this, this bill for me. Actually, what I'm saying, I want you to impersonate me when you go there and yeah. you can do anything and it looks like I'm doing it. Yeah. And and, and that's, I think, a, a perception we need to get much clearer. So people stop sharing passwords, stop sharing their credentials. Yeah, I agree. You're relying on someone else to protect your credentials as, as, as well as they with their own, assuming that they protect their own very well. You know, once I've given you my password, how do I know that you're not going to go, well, oh, I don't want to forget that. I'll just write it down in this napkin and then leave the cafe with the napkin once I'm allowed yeah. to go back into cafes, of course. Oh, yeah, and I think that also um, by being more digital, uh, it also makes the world a lot smaller because uh, we don't travel anymore. I mean, um, the differences between different countries and different con continents, there will be time zones. But um, when you work in a digital way, more in a digital way, uh, which we do with COVID, you place becomes less important in, yes. a, in, a, in a way. Yeah, far yeah. less than it used to be so you're yeah. you could have a much larger working scope or uh domain that you are aware of and that you're interacting with which you could have done before but you didn't and i think that's Sorry. also that could change a lot of uh impact in the legal atmosphere here, where you have legislations in different places Absolutely. also european law now needs to speed yeah. up a lot to manage all this stuff so um what I think, and maybe it's even a prediction, is that uh, there could be a whole branch of uh, which already exists a bit for IT legislation, for um, how to work together in con uh, conglomerates of uh, groups working together, not being from the own organization, but just mixing and mingling different skills and people, uh, and how do you do your liabilities and things digitally that could be an interesting part on the legal side because that's what businesses need they want to be legally safe and but digitally everything is possible so i'm, I'm really wondering what's going to how that's going to evolve uh mm. within europe uh, i'm i know lots of things are happening but also uh, and, and outside of europe cross border well. outside <laughs> europe <laughs> yes <laughs> sorry for you <laughs> but, but that could be i mean Th that's that's an interesting <laughs> basic fundament that would enable us to make this whole positive effect be more effective even and to take away the scares that could be still there. Hmm. And it's, no, it's also interesting seeing meetings going from pretty much audio only pre-COVID and now the norm is everybody is on video and that brings us closer as well. I mean, we, when you see each other, that's you know creates mm -hmm. a different uh, dynamic in your home environment yeah yeah, yeah. exactly so we asked if the organization offer 100 percent digital services and half say yes which is good uh big part says almost so that means there's uh, some uh, not digital involved uh so it's yeah any comments um i think so 100% digital services. It could be again. Could be our de a demographic here is 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 biasing our our uh, our survey slightly. But again, it's I, I think given what we're talking about, the nature of our discussion, I, I think that makes sense that we're seeing a lot of people that are 100% digital and are on here to discuss fraud and make sure that they are at the right level of awareness about the fraud that's out there. Uh, and then we've got people that are on the way towards it, and then people that are maybe being a bit conservative, saying I don't know if we're 100%. Right. And no one's saying no, because I think to come here, you'd have to have an interest in this. You'd have to have some kind of digital service. Exactly. Um, time is flying. I mean, let's let's touch on on uh, on on the on the future. I mean, where where are we going? We touched on some of it. I mentioned I like my phone to know uh, uh, that it's in my possession. But what's what's the future of? 
this, you know, how do we reduce the fraud, prevent it? Well, this is, I, I, I think we're, we're, we're always fighting against the fraudster, but, and the fraudsters are becoming more creative. And we've seen uh, a lot of fraudsters who were less au fait with the online environment have now switched. So at the start of lockdown and over the initial lockdown period, we've seen people that are new to the realm who have been much more attuned to physical fraud and that's been the way they've made money. We've had a lot of professional fraudsters who've continued to thrive, but I think the fact that you've got this new influx of fraudsters, some of them are professional, uh, you know, that th this is how they make their living. Uh, some are unprofessional who have just sort of been exposed to this as a, an avenue for making money. Um, but I think the fact that we've got this influx of new professionals is probably the more worrying idea because whenever you bring new ideas to bear on, uh, sorry, new minds to bear on an idea, that's where you have some more creative solutions. Um, so I think that's what we're going to see is we're going to see more and more, you know, it, it's, it's a fairly easy prediction to make, but I think we're going to see um, more and more creative uh, attempts at fraud, more innovation, um, which is going to push us to come up with more innovative uh, solutions to combat that. So I think we're going to see spoofing increase. I think, that as I mentioned earlier, deep fakes is something that's been around for a little while, um, but it's certainly starting to get a lot more traction and it's becoming a lot easier to obtain. You can do it on apps yourself quite happily. The fact we're seeing it turn up on social media platforms like TikTok as a fun idea, um, you know, it, it's, it's becoming too commonplace. We're seeing people come up with solutions that can check for if something's been uh, spoofed as a deep fake. I, th I think we're going to see a lot yeah. of progress in that arena, in that particular field, because it is very much a new technology. It's not the only place we're going to see improvements. It's not the only place that we're going to see uh, innovation, but it's certainly one of the biggest areas I think we're going to see in certainly the next year or two. Yeah, I, um, I think that the trend that it's already going on, where you see big um, uh, security companies like Symantec, eh, maybe on the um, started out with the viruses. Microsoft started with the desktop, um, Zscaler. A lot of companies that are coming from different areas for security, network, desktop, whatever. They are uh, more and more sharing their data on fraud. There, so you get very big databases where they gather, uh, this is also done by governments and by nations, where you gather most of the, uh, the bad data about the fraudsters, these website registrations for phishing. There's uh, millions and trillions of databases all joining together. And I think the trend could be that this sharing of information about the bad guys um, is more effective having one big net to catch the fish instead of each having their own small net by joining yep. that up, uh, combining it with uh, pattern recognitions and artificial intelligence or intelligence algorithm that um, improve themselves. And uh, that detection monitoring, I think that will, uh, there's still a lot of things uh, to uh, improve uh, and working together instead of uh, each doing their work separately. The same trend is going on in a lot of industries, in banking also, where you have the payment service directive too, where one bank can show all the bank accounts from other banks in their one app. So you can do all payments from one app and they have their own infrastructure or they even share their fraud infrastructure here in the Netherlands. The, 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 so these things, I think this mixing and sharing of fraud information and detection, that's good. Uh, I see that this will go on like it goes on in identity where we have the self-sovereign identity where it's all distributed and joined together um cooperation in um um yeah coalitions that i think that's the way forward for combating uh fraud and i think it's a trend that's already starting since a few years yeah well i, I think what i'd like to see is um i mean we're a lot of the solutions we're talking about here are in the financial services and in private industry. Mm. I'd like to see, I'd like to see government kind of stepping up or yeah. being more open to collaboration, being more open to intel sharing, because mm -hmm. a lot of the good intel is coming from the private sector, which is where coincidentally the crime is taking place. Um, and maybe uh, the legislation 
is a bit of a hindrance in certain yeah. aspects because it hasn't been yeah. properly catered towards the environment we're looking at. So now is a period where we're starting to see all of this yeah. change take place. And I think as a result, legislation has to be more up to date. It has to be yeah. more in line yeah. with the current exactly. environment. Right. It will always be back. It will always be a few years. Yeah. yeah. But I do it's, see some trends in the European Union, for instance, for identity. They're building their own self sovereign identity, European infrastructure that parties could connect to, which mm. could make things a lot more secure, at least for the identity part also for individuals and smaller companies to reuse. And a lot of innovation is going on there, which uh, I see most of these projects. I mean, one of the, my jobs is reviewing them for subsidizing them. And a lot of innovation is going on there. And it makes me really hopeful because if at that level uh, there is money and there is attention and actually mm. things are happening, mm. I think uh, the, the projects they're doing next generation internet and gi you can browse it on the web that's um that should happen in most of these sectors also for fraud detection and for uh other things making the world safety safer because the next thing another thing in the future is to my opinion a digital uh second world war but a third world war that will be digital and we already get these messages from um state in stated um Initiate state initiated fraud and uh, yeah, um, stealing uh, uh, intellectual property and so on. I think that that's a battlefield. We, I think, most governments are just beginning to understand how important this is to mm. scale up. And in, in Europe, I think we we could be really vulnerable. Uh, so, yeah, maybe well, I, I, I could. This, this is the danger of having databases, isn't it? It's if you have a database, then you have a large store of goodies to go and hack. Whereas centralized, if you have of, yeah. If you yeah, have treasury, lots of individual yeah. silos, then it's it's a lot harder. Yeah. I think. Um, yeah. But, uh, but I, everything really... is interconnected nowadays. So from one to the other, stepping stones and moving on. Yeah. Right, but I, I, think, I mean, uh, yeah. doing. Uh, I mean, we're almost out of time here. But I mean, I agree with what you're saying. I mean, the cooperation is important. We need to join forces to to fight this. Yeah. Uh, also, on the regulatory side, I mean, EIDAS defines you know different mm -hmm. levels of assurance, but there is actually currently mm -hmm. no standard for how you onboard somebody. So that's working Etsy going on now to standardize. And that's where it starts, huh? Yeah. yeah. Right. So we need to agree. Yeah. I mean, if you go to different countries, you have different ways of doing the onboarding and and uh, and so on. Yeah. So standardizing on that, agreeing on how we're going to do it, try to agree on the legal frameworks, which is of course difficult. But all this, and I mean, it boils down to you mentioned the the COVID boils down to identity. If you always knew who was at the other end of the transaction, if you had definite proof of that person, well, fraudster would have a really hard job to to do what they're trying to do. Yeah, yeah I, I identity think that's, is that's the real your, parameter. Yeah, yeah. You're, 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 but you're never um, gonna have the, the problem truth. is with legislation. The problem with le legislation is that you can't measure um, security. You can measure measure the chance and the risk. Huh? That's a calculation, which is a prediction on the risk, huh? chance per impact, and then you get a level of risk, which changes every moment because the situation changes and the attackers change every minute. That's not a fixed thing, but security to defend against that risk, that is also not something you can prescribe because security is, uh, it's not a dike and you know it needs to be 50 centimeters and then it's safe because the water came to here and it will be safe when we make it higher because attack can from be from anywhere. And if you prescribe in a legislation, what measures, what technical things people need to do to be secure, that's already all day outdated when the legislation is ready. And it has to be generic because it has to be applicable everywhere. But at yeah. the same time, if it's not precise, people start doing a lot of different things and still you have no standards. So implementing yeah, well, standards, yeah. This, this, and this refresh them one, of my, all the time. one of my points as well. Your your solution yeah. is only as good as your lowest level of technology in, in the whole network. Yeah. So if, if we're talking about yeah. anything being done by a mobile phone and we, we, talk, we talk about um, how it can record my gait yeah. and it can you know capture my thumb, that's great if you've got what, you know a very new smartphone. What if you're not privileged with one of those? Mm -hmm. What if you're, you're, you're in a country or you can only afford something that's kind of like several generations back or you don't even have a mobile phone? So whenever oh, we you talk don't want about to things, because you think yeah. it's private. 
Right, yeah. exactly. So, but, I mean, yeah. uh, sorry, guys. I mean, I'm sure we could continue this discussion for another hour, but unfortunately, we are out of time. I mean, this this is, you know, yeah, I know it's it's a really interesting and really I important was just topic. Up then. And, yeah, we were just getting started, right? <laughs> So, but I mean, this was, you know, some feedback from from the audience on, you know, uh, the most influenced security is high hair. We see digital services and a lot of words. So, um, I think we'll just have to to leave it at that. I was uh, hoping to lunch. This one says sorry. Um, do some audience questions as well, but we are out of time. Uh, please reach out to to any of us if if you do have any questions. Thank you so much to Jacoba and Simon for this really interesting uh, discussion. I really yeah, enjoyed this and a uh, really important really topic. So really good to have you here. Thanks. It's been, it's been great. I've thanks for having talking. us. So, yeah. and thanks to the audience. Like I said, reach out if there's anything you want to learn about this. And uh, uh, yeah, you will receive a follow-up email with, with some information as well. So thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye from the Netherlands. And bye-bye from what's left of the UK. And bye-bye from Norway. <laughs>